Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Hangouts and Headlines stream, 7 a.m. here on the Eastern time zone of the United States. Hopefully you've got your coffee or your tea ready. I know people like to comment on the, uh, I guess it's that, what, giraffe print uh, tea mug uh, that my co-counsel, Mrs. Hoglaw, basically always prepares for me every morning. Thank you so much, honey. I can't do any of this without you, and I'm sorry that you have to get up so early uh, to hang out with me now that we're doing these episodes. Uh, but uh, how is everybody doing? How did everybody enjoy yesterday? I told you uh, in our kind of behind the scenes, we were going to have a very long stream uh, on the channel, a little unusual one about video games, more specifically, uh, the BitCast season gaming. I don't know how many of you might have popped in to check that out, either here or there. Uh, but what was supposed to be, I think, a two-hour stream wound up being a little under four hours. Uh, so that was unexpected. Uh, but if you did check in, hopefully you enjoyed that kind of content. Where is everybody uh, calling in from? I got to come up with a better term for that. I guess watching from. Uh, but uh, I've listened to a lot of radio and commutes in my day, so maybe I'm just used to saying uh, calling in. I haven't had a super chat yet, say something like uh, long-time listener, first-time caller, uh, so that'd, uh, that'd be wild. But hopefully everybody's doing well. I've got Munich, Singapore, Japan, Georgia. Hello, co-counsel, says someone. Uh, rookie numbers, I don't know. Probably true. I don't know what they're referring to here, but I often have rookie numbers. That's accurate. Virginia, the Netherlands. Washington, the Ozarks, Texas, fantastic stuff, everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, as, as you saw from today's thumbnail, uh, we're going to be doing an article that at least on its face isn't ostensibly about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. We are actually going to have some references uh, to Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But as I said earlier this week and in prior weeks, headlines, hangouts, this is designed so that we don't have to stop doing this when the uh, journalistic outlets finally tire of covering various aspects of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Now, I know, for one, that Amber Heard's going to have an interview this week. Apparently, she's already done it. They're pulling clips out like they like to do to try to get you interested in whenever that interview airs. I'll look up when that will be. I don't know how we will cover that because my longstanding tradition here has been to avoid video footage uh, and to otherwise transcribe those things and comment on them specifically. I might do that here uh, with respect to that interview. Uh, I might try to pull clips uh, and otherwise talk over them. Really depends on what is said. You know, if it's just banal nonsense and there's nothing interesting to go over, I value your time. I don't want to just have videos here that have you click on them just to hear me speak if I don't have anything of value to add uh, in terms of criticism or discussion of what she says. So I'll be evaluating those uh, when they happen. Uh, but I have to believe that we're coming up in a world where these headlines are going to stop being about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard at least a little bit. We'll probably still cover it, you know, a while yet. Uh, but I want to start advancing this into other areas uh, because there's a lot of things to be interested in. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking about an ethics question mark uh, for the Sydney Morning Herald, a newspaper out of Australia. And it's not just whether it's a question mark and how they ethically behaved. It's also how they behaved afterwards. It's actually more specifically that kind of an overall complaint about having to meet ethical bounds uh, that I found very, very interesting as a jumping off point for discussion. So hopefully you will find that interesting as well, because I know the subject matter of some of these stories uh, can seem a, a little light or inconsequential. A lot of people want us to cover uh, more serious stuff here. If you haven't been following me in virtual legality for a long time, one of the premises of this channel is that we can talk about important concepts, important ideas, and things that can affect you in serious and important ways without the baggage of having to talk about areas of high sensitivity at the same time, right? And I don't think there's anything wrong with anybody on YouTube or elsewise talking about uh, various political things or international conflicts or whatnot. But I think that there's a sensitivity to that in the day uh, that it's happening, the, the present day. And I'd like to avoid that so that we can have kind of more critical analyses that don't drag in all of this extra stuff. Um, so that's why virtual legality proper is focused on movies and video games and technology and things that maybe don't have that sensitivity in your or my real life, quote unquote. 
Um, but I do appreciate all the people that have commented and asked me to talk about committee hearings and various other things here. Sometimes I do that if I think that I have something to add uh, and it gets to a high enough level. You've seen me talk about Supreme Court cases. You saw me talk about the leak uh, earlier this year. Uh, and I will do that on occasion, but it's not the bread and butter here. So I do apologize for anybody that's upset about that. I have gotten some notes. They're like, why aren't you covering this stuff? Uh, that has been the philosophy of this channel. Uh, if you do ask me in one of those comments or you DM me, I can usually direct you to someone that is covering those kinds of things. So you can check it out. Uh, but that has always been my modus operandi. That's what this channel is about. Um, and if that's not where you live on some of this stuff, I don't blame you. Uh, you can absolutely check it out in other places. Uh, but that's going to be the working philosophy here um, because that's where I think I can be the most effective. That's what I like to do. And honestly, it has to be something that I'm interested in in order to have these conversations in the first place, because otherwise, you know, what are we doing here? You don't want to just hear me bloviate into the sky about nonsense uh, for hours on end, I don't think. Um, but with that as background, I've got uh, I've got a super chat here. We could dive into the story uh, in just a second. If you do have some questions or comments here before we dive in, uh, you know, let me know. It doesn't have to be a super chat, of course. If I can see it, if you got a whole law and I, it pops up on my screen, I'm happy to chat with you uh, either way. But first, here's fun times. Hi from Texas. Good morning. Thank you so much for the super chat, fun times. I very much appreciate the support for the channel. Um, with that said, let's see what else we've got here. So everybody seems to be okay uh, with the messaging on what we're going to cover here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, rainy day 15. It's hard to think critically when emotional. So I love this take. That's what I've found, right? And I found that in my own life, right? I'm not impervious to this kind of thing. If you're very passionate about something, if you have that high level of sensitivity, that's totally fine. That's the human experience. But it does mean that what I want to talk about, how to think about things, how to analyze things, how to think critically, is not only going to be colored with that emotionality or passion, if you'd prefer that term, but also you start getting into things about like, well, what is what does Rick think? How is he trying to steer me? What kind of manipulation is he doing? And I think hopefully you don't think that about the topics we otherwise cover here. I try certainly very hard not to do that. But when you add that level of passion, that emotionality, I think you do get into those conversations. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, Mrs. Hoaglaw sounds like a type of food. I think they must be talking about a different conversation. Sometimes I feel like we just peek in on whatever my wife is actually doing here in the comments because I don't think Mrs. Hoaglaw as a term itself sounds like a type of food. So this must be another conversation about cucumber sandwiches or Downton Abbey or whatever. But we'll, we'll get out of here. I actually feel like I'm intruding here in my own chat. Uh, hoagies. Hoagies is a type of food. Uh, so... All right, let's, oh, okay. All right, what's happening? We want to know if the camera says hoagies. Hoagies? Like if the chat, that's what the chat is supposed to call themselves. The chat can call themselves what they like. She's, you, you notice that co-counsel is not upset about just popping in with a squeaky door and now talking directly to me. We're long past post-it notes here, folks. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, honestly, uh, I'm happy with anything. I, uh, I want you guys to feel comfortable with what you're calling yourselves in any capacity uh, here in the chat. Uh, so the Heathers here says, I'm a hoagie. Kirikaw says she's WD-40 or, or he's WD-40. I think that's probably a reference to the squeaky door, but maybe that's just how you roll. You guys can be the WD-40s. I, I don't really know there. We got some video game controllers. Apple Pie wants to know if I've played Day of the Tentacle. Of course I've played Day of the Tentacle. Day of the Tentacle is a classic adventure game about time travel uh, and the American founding and toilets. Uh, so do check that out. It's a, I think it's 90s. I think it's from the 90s. Uh, but yeah, I've definitely played um, Day of the Tentacle. Tiny Trifle. Ha ha ha. That pop in from Mrs. Hoaglaw was adorable. It's what she does. She does adorableness and trying to correct me from doing wrong things. Uh, so it's really a combo package. Uh, and she's very, very effective at it. Uh, Kane Yusunagi. Hey, Rick. So I just read the apology article. It seems like it was just a misunderstanding to me without any further information. Interested to hear your take on it. Yeah. I mean, they want, <laughs> we're, we're spoiler alerting this a little bit. They want you to think it's a misunderstanding. Uh, but in particular, the initial article as it was presented, I think belies that uh, a little bit. And so, yeah, I don't mind uh, human beings making mistakes. We're going to talk about that. I don't mind it. Uh, but I do think it throws up at least a yellow flag when you have the instant reaction in the moment uh, that was shown in this set of articles that we're going to look at. So uh, we'll definitely talk about that as we get into the headlines here. I just like chatting with you before we dive in. Uh, let's see here. 
Outrageous. Co-counsel, way back mid trial. Rick avoid, uh, avoided repeating hoagies as avatar. He did adopt the game controller despite lots of sandwich emojis. Honestly, I was okay with the sandwich or the game controller. So it was it was fine. It's just that's what people came up with. I view that kind of thing as outside my control. So unless it's like offensive, um, I want everybody to feel comfortable with whatever they're doing with that kind of thing. Uh, let's see here. Good morning, Hogan co-counsel from Wichita, Kansas. Hello, Kansas. Good morning from Kalamazoo. That's my neck of the woods. That's Michigan. Stacy says I'm definitely a hoagie. CG, I like Hoag's laid back, anything goes attitude today. I honestly think that Hangouts and Headlines plays best if we kind of roll in. We have a bit of a hangout. We get excited. You know, it's early morning here. Frankly, sometimes I need to get up to speed a little bit before we're going to dive deep into some uh, important stuff in terms of how reporting is done and headlines and articles about those various things. So I like this portion of the show. I know some people don't like it, which is why we have a new playlist called Just the Headlines, which currently has, I think, two headlines in it but i will tell you behind the scenes my editor has me prepped with like 50 or 55 so one thing i should say in terms of the kind of behind the scenes administrative stuff is don't unsubscribe when you just see like 600 of these go up uh, because they are big and we have to make sure they get uploaded <laughs> in a fairly reasonable amount of time uh, once they are done uh, so you are going to get just a massive amount of just the headlines additional content when i can get to it during my workday. Uh, so uh, apologies there. Please do check them out. I know I've been discussing with people that they've been uh, sometimes confused about whether or not that was new content or not. Just the headlines is always going to be excerpts of just the headlines. So if you take this stream, for instance, all of this that we're doing right now, it's going to stay in this stream, not going to be just the headlines. But what the hope is, if we get this mechanically right going forward, is that when we dive into talking analytically about the contents of the article itself, that that can be pulled, made it adjust the headlines. And then if you're the kind of viewer or listener that doesn't like all of this blather from Hogue, just talking about nonsense and hanging out with folks, then you don't have to actually listen to it. You can just go to the analytics because you just really want to see me highlight some stuff uh, in some articles, which is totally fair. I like highlighting stuff in articles too. Uh, so we're going to do that playlist together, but there is going to be a big one because we got about a month and a half to catch up on which is remarkable to me, by the way, when I was doing this with my editor the other day, I keep thinking that we've only been doing Hangouts and Headlines for a couple of weeks. Um, and May 7th was the first one of these. May 7th was the big 10 plus hour stream. And that's just really amazing to me because I have been having so much fun with you all having these conversations. I didn't even realize that we've been doing these kinds of episodes for more than a month. Uh, at this point in time. So yeah, absolutely. Laid back attitude, get up to speed, get some tea, get some coffee. Just basically have fun hanging out. Uh, that's what this is uh, all about here in the early morning hour. And hopefully you're enjoying it as much as I am. Uh, so they're talking about sandwiches here. We've got a couple super chats and I think we can, I think we're pretty prepped to dive in here. So Samantha Eason back for another chat. Hi, Samantha. Very annoyed with gaslighting in the media. That's all for me from now. Have a good night. All right. I don't know where you're uh, calling in from, uh, but you have a good night wherever that might be. And thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, Annette Matz, good evening from Melbourne or Melbourne, Australia. I never know how they pronounce these things. I, I, Brisbane is Brisbane. Is Melbourne, Melbourne? I don't know. I have to watch more episodes of Bluey to really get these pronunciations down, but you tell me if I got that remotely close to right. The American in me wants to say Melbourne, but I suspect that's not how you would prefer me to say it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it's Melbourne. We'll see. Good evening from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, and then uh, let's let's press on. So we've got this article, right? And as I said, in the broad scope of the sweep of the universe's history. This is a fairly light article. And I think someone even chatted and said, hey, it seemed like just a mistake. That's totally fine. Sometimes we can look at these things best when we're looking at them as essentially somewhat innocuous. Now, I will tell you that what this is about is about outing someone, talking about their partnership status uh, in a way that they might prefer not to have talked about. Uh, so... That is an area of sensitivity for a number of folks, obviously, and with good reason. 
Uh, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because of the way it was written and then the responses that this particular outlet, the Sydney Morning Herald, I believe, uh, actually had to it. So here we have an opinion piece. It's June 11th, <clears throat> 2022. That's three days ago. Rebel, and this is referring to Rebel Wilson, an actress, starts spreading the news of relationship. And that could be interesting, but <clears throat> if you followed any of this and you looked at this article before, you know that this is actually a little bit damning just from the very headline itself. Because one of the things that the Sydney Morning Herald, or more specifically, this columnist, is upset about is the fact that Rebel started spreading the news of this relationship effectively without them and on notice that they were going to put an article up. So we take a look at this article. It's very long. Oh, oh no. This Private Sydney column, and apparently Private Sydney is, as best I can tell, kind of one of their column names for like celebrity culture. I, I don't know how deep it goes, gossiping, that kind of thing that you might expect from, from some newspapers uh, of some type. So this is the, the individual, this is the columnist that goes and talks about celebrity relationships or what's happening. This is the kind of guy that would have been reporting on Depth he heard during that process um, or, or even while they were married. Uh, the private Sydney column about Rebel Wilson has been taken down. Here, Andrew Hornery says he made mistakes and will learn from them. And that's the author here. And that's the headline that I used in the thumbnail. But the article is gone. Now, that's interesting, right? And I'd be interested in your comments here in terms of ethics and rules and things. We've talked a lot in this space about how the Washington Post has really tripped all over itself trying to explain the unexplainable with what it included in the article about the YouTubers covering the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial uh, and the mistakes it made in saying that they were contacted or they were attempted to be contacted, et cetera, et cetera. But the article has stayed up with a big, long editor's note. Um, and in terms of how to deal with one of these things, it is an open question to me about whether or not it's a good idea to completely remove it because... I, well, I'll be honest that this article wasn't really made in good faith. We're going to take some of the clips because they were captured on Twitter. As all things are, the internet is forever. Or whether it's better to have the kind of editor's note approach. This is wrong. Here's our apology. But here's how it looked when we got things wrong, essentially to continue to hold our feet to the fire. Because this is going to be lost to the mists of time a little bit, even though we can build it back together with the archive or with the Twitter, et cetera it's a little bit less transparent than it otherwise would have been. And I'm, I'm really of two minds on this. I think it's good to not have stuff that is essentially in poor taste out there uh, and, and just aimed at them directly. But also, if you're an outlet like this, to just say, hey, it's gone, here's our apology, uh, I don't know. I'd like to reflect on what exactly you're apologizing for. And I don't know that I can do that as easily if I'm a reader of your paper when this is the format that you take. So I, I'm not coming down too harshly either direction on this, but it did surprise me that it was just gone. It wasn't a note. It's We've taken it down. It is, it is gone because it isn't the kind of thing that is uh, erroneous on its face. And we're going to take a look at it. Instead, it just kind of looks bad for the newspaper. And if that's the context, I think my inclination is to say, well, this is probably the kind of newspaper report that should stay up because it just makes you look bad. Uh, and this is otherwise going to be known uh, news, and you should reflect on what you've done. But thankfully, we can reflect on what they've done for them. So this is a Twitter account that was actually linked to me. Like I said, I do follow your DMs, uh, and a couple of people sent me this article to talk about. This is a Twitter account from Mega Mohan, who I believe is with the BBC, if, I, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, staff reporter for BBC World. Uh, I've just read this Sydney Morning Herald piece three times to make sure that I wasn't misreading. The publication messaged Rebel Wilson saying they would out her in two days and is now complaining that she chose to announce her relationship with a woman herself. Quite astonishing. And it really is. If you actually look at this. So uh, and I apologize for it being so small. If we look at this article, it has kind of style that I guess I expect from gossip columns. It has that kind of, oh, we're all in it. We're whispering around a table kind of thing. And I think that's probably how it's designed to be written. So we can look at it with those eyes, but that doesn't make this concept any better. So it says, Rebel starts spreading the news of relationship, coming out Rebel style in a perfect world, quote unquote, outing, same sex celebrity relationship should be a redundant concept in 2022. Love is love, right? So that's what he starts out with. 
he is trying to establish, and he will try to establish more fulsomely, that this is something that should be a happy thing. And so he didn't view it as something that would be threatening or otherwise that the Rebel Wilsons of the world would have to get in front of. But as Rebel Wilson knows, we do not live in a perfect world. So it was an abundance of caution and respect that this media outlet emailed Rebel Wilson's representatives on Thursday morning, giving her two days to comment on her new relationship with another woman, LA leisure wear designer, Ramona Agruma, before publishing a single word. Big mistake, says this author. Wilson opted to kazump the story, posting about how her new Disney princess on Instagram early Friday morning, the same platform she had previously used to brag about her handsome ex-boyfriend, wealthy American beer baron, that's a heck of a title, Jacob Bush. And I think she even had her bestie, the author Hugh Sheridan, doing radio interviews on Breakfast FM on Friday morning, during which he gloated about introducing the women to each other six months ago. Apparently, they had hit it off pretty much immediately, but had kept the relationship under wraps. Considering how bitterly Wilson had complained about poor journalism standards when she successfully sued Women's Day for defamation, her choice to ignore our discreet, genuine, and honest queries was, in our view, underwhelming. So this is the article that gets taken down. And outside of the subject matter, as I said, uh, you know, this is obviously an area of sensitivity. An outlet should know that uh, and not really expect anything different in terms of how a subject would respond. But the actual problem I have with this isn't so much uh, that you're even grumpy about it. This is, I think, grumpy will be the term that they use, I believe, not the Amber Heard version of grumpy, uh, but a different version of grumpy, but that you actually go out in your column and effectively treat this news item like you're the owner of it, right? I had to actually look up the phrase gazump. Uh, I didn't know this. Apparently, it's informal British, uh, but it means basically in this context to swindle, right? That the implication here is that I sent you a notice because I'm a good ethical journalist. We're going to talk about ethics in just a second. And you had the audacity to reveal this news item yourself. You knew we were going to make a story. We asked you for comment. And then you gazumped us, or more specifically, you gazumped the story. Uh, and you went out with this news item on your own. And, and my initial reaction to this is, yeah, that's her story to tell. And not only did you uh, put her in a position where I can imagine the public relations communications and how are we going to handle this and all these various things, because that's what happens when a journalist calls you or emails you and says, you have two days to tell us something on this, or I'm going to publish this story. But it is entirely her news item. So to then complain about it, to then have a finish off to your column that says, we find it underwhelming because you complained about poor journalism in another capacity, as if you have some obligation to respond to us, that we have the right to the story and how dare you go out with it on your own is amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. But you do get some insight into at least how some folks think about this process in the moment. We're going to look at apologies. They're going to walk all this back. That's totally fine. But... When we do look at those apologies, it's important to remember how things reacted uh, in the first instance. Oh, and I have a different definition here, so I apologize. Again, gazump, not a phrase I'm familiar with. We've got Kirikaz here saying it is to trump, not the politics, the, the original definition, to trump or one-up someone. There's two definitions. I really appreciate that. So not to swindle, although it's coming from the same kind of tree of understanding, I would be willing to bet, but effectively to say to take our thing and to do it in front of us, to do it better, to trump our, our story, which makes a lot more sense uh, more specifically. So I appreciate that. Uh, and, and here we have a super chat. Rebel is a qualified lawyer in Australia or, or elsewhere. That's actually really, really interesting. Um, and it was interesting to see that there was a, a reference to a fact that she had already been involved in a defamation lawsuit. Um, but thank you for the super chat there. A lot of good information here. And we're going to look at, at, like I said, the apologies. But as a starting point, like this goes out. And it's, it's, yes, it's a celebration is what they will later say of this great news. It's this stuff that is, that is crazy to me, right? Big mistake. She went up in front of us and did this story. And we're going to see, we're going to see how they react to this, right? Because this is uh, June 11th. We're going to see a note on June 12th. We're going to talk about ethics a little bit first though, uh, right? Because as we know, we've been talked about as tabloid grifters. We've been talked about as various things. We aren't the Pointner Institute. 
we can't hold journalists to ethical standards, except as I said in that video, the ethical standards are for us. The ethical standards are for the consuming public because journalists could do whatever they want. Uh, and we're going to talk about legalities here a little bit, but ethics are important because this is a process that is ostensibly done by professionals and they should have rules. Lawyers have rules. Lawyers have a bar. We can get decertified. We can no longer be a lawyer or practice as a lawyer uh, if our bar associations find that we did something wrong. There isn't a similar kind of at least technical concept for journalists in, in most instances. And I've pulled up uh, the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. There are like hundreds of these, um, but there were a number of references to this one. So I thought we would use this as just a jumping off point. I can't promise you that this is what the Sydney Morning Herald follows. In fact, I would be willing to bet it doesn't. Uh, but all of these share certain conceits and we can talk about them, right? So the members of the Society of Professional Journalists believe that public enlightenment is the forerunner of justice and the foundation of democracy. So, you know, light stakes here. Ethical journalism strives to ensure the free exchange of information that is accurate, fair, and thorough. An ethical journalist acts with integrity. And the Society declares these four principles as the foundation of ethical journalism and encourages their use in its practice by all people in the media. So the first principle, seek the truth and report it. Seemingly simple enough, but we're going to have some sub rules here. Ethical journalism should be accurate and fair. It's a good starting point. Accuracy. Journalists should be honest and courageous in gathering, reporting, and interpreting information. But journalists should take responsibility for the accuracy of the work. Remember that neither speed nor format excuses inaccuracy. Format's going to be important here. Provide context. Gather, update, and correct information throughout the life of a news story. We see the Washington Post struggling with that one. Be cautious when making promises. Identify sources clearly. Consider sources' motives before promising anonymity. None of that pops up here. Diligently seek subjects of news coverage to allow them to respond to criticism or allegations of wrongdoing. Now, the focus here is criticism and wrongdoing. I, uh, ostensibly, hey, make sure that you go get comment from people that are being put in a negative light. And one of the defenses that the Sydney Morning Herald author and editor has here is effectively... We hadn't actually decided to publish what this story would look like when we sent out the comment. And <clears throat> this is a happy day kind of news story. But even in that column, that fact is belied because he says, we know that we don't live in a perfect world. We know that this kind of private information is private for a reason and that you should have a good reason from an ethical standpoint of going in and putting out this kind of news story. Now, he also will say, well, look, I run a gossip column. Uh, and so it presents different ethical standards. We already talked about format, but what's important here is that you should go and try to seek comment from folks that you are going to put in this negative light. It's also probably, if we're breaking things down uh, on another axis, why the Washington Post, either Lorenz, the reporter or the editor, puts that parenthetical in with respect to legal bites and that umbrella guy because that is rightfully seen as a negative light. They are included in that article to show they are motivated by money. And this platform is moving people in different directions. They are pivoting towards directions where the money is. And we need to look at YouTube and be very, very cross uh, with that platform. But they didn't do that. So that's probably why the item comes in. And yet they didn't actually seek comment. And it looks like they scrambled because they know that they should have. Now, I honestly don't think that they really ne needed to seek comment from Alita at Legal Bites or that umbrella guy. And so I think this is kind of inconsequential. But the Washington Post might feel very differently about that, which is why potentially you saw them scrambling around this entire concept. Because once they thought they should have and they knew they didn't, it becomes a different ball of wax. You're supposed to avoid undercover or other surreptitious methods of gathering information unless you really have to. It's a good ethical rule, by the way. Be vigilant and courageous about holding those with power accountable. Support the open and civil exchange of views, even views you find repugnant. Recognize a special obligation to serve as watchdogs over public affairs. Provide access to source material when it's relevant. Boldly tell the story of the diversity and magnitude of the human experience. Avoid stereotyping, label advocacy, label advocacy and commentary. That's one that I don't think the journalists do very well at all. We certainly try here in virtual legality, but you are supposed to say, hey, now I'm advocating. Now this is an editorial because the rest is news, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see that quite often enough for my liking. I don't know about you. Um, and then we've got minimize harm. Balance the public's need for information against potential harm or discomfort. Now this gets kind of dicey and we might even discuss this in a different format uh, in a different articles setting. 
but you're supposed to look at this and say, how important is this really? What does it take to get the information? And in the grand scheme uh, of the universe, just as I said before we started talking about this article, Rebel Wilson's love life is very low on the list of things that we as a public need to know about. Show compassion for those who may be affected by news coverage. Recognize that legal access to information differs from an ethical justification to publish or broadcast. I love this one, right? Because you've heard me say in this space, what is right is not always legal. And what is legal is not always right. And that's a very important kind of concept because laws are written by people. They are words on the page. They are the rules of the board game that you unpack and dump on your table. They tell you how to play it, but it might not be the best way to play it. And so you always have to evaluate these things. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? We've got CGI dinosaurs running across America and movie theaters all around the world because of that very notion. They didn't ask whether they should, they just asked whether they could. And this is a great rule. It unfortunately doesn't inform the average journalist in any specific way. Hey, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. That just refers to the rest of the rules for whatever your ethical reasoning might be. But it's still a good concept. Just because you stumble across this information, just because you develop and acquire this information doesn't mean it's important enough, right? We're in the section about minimizing harm. Realize that private people have a greater right to control information about themselves than public figures and others who seek power, influence, or attention. Weigh the consequences of publishing or broadcasting personal information. And here again, we run up against this concept, right? Rebel Wilson is a public figure of a sort. But as far as I know, she's not seeking to pass laws. She's not seeking to affect political change or otherwise impose on the rest of the body politic, either in Australia or the globe. Uh, she is an actress. And maybe I'm wrong there. Maybe she's a, a very adamant activist on some things that she cares about. I don't know. You guys can leave that in the chat. But overall, when they talk about this rule, the way I read it, it's more about, hey, you probably have additional leeway when you're talking about a president, when you're talking about someone that is otherwise doing something that can affect us all rather than an actress that is, you know, in an acapella movie and that kind of thing. So when we look at these, I think it's important to put them in context. And right now you have all this context that says, hey, go get contact, go be aware of the discomfort you cause, figure out whether you should be putting this, avoid pandering to lurid curiosity, which uh, is a great phrase. I, I want, it's a great like band name. Lurid curiosity is, a, is an awesome bit of, of language here and I love it, but avoid pandering to it even if others do, right? When you're looking at this and other journalists pander to lurid curiosity, try to be better, try to be more professional. Uh, and I think honestly, this is where you see some of the kind of high and mighty moralistic standards that the Guardian or the New York Times or the Washington Post has put on like the depth be heard kind of uh, concept, right? In Taylor Lorenz's article about YouTube coverage is a whole paragraph about, well, while we were worried about important things, these people were handling this trial. And, you know, there's a certain element of truthfulness there, but there's a certain element of just trying to sit on your high horse and not pay attention to what people are interested in legitimately, right? This isn't people dumpster diving and figuring out what was happening in this marriage. This was an actual public court trial that had implications that now the media is trying to say existed the whole time, right? If, if this is so darn important to all these various things that you're otherwise chin stroking or navel gazing about, then wasn't it worth the time to cover the trial in the first instance? Obviously, but that's the kind of trap they get into. Now, I didn't cover the rest of these rules as much because they don't impact this. Act independently, don't take bribes and things, and be accountable and transparent, where we see things like fix your mistakes and correct them promptly and prominently. Explain corrections and clarifications carefully and clearly. This one's for you, Washington Post. You should check this one out right here. I think you could do that better. But that's the ethics of the situation, right? And I think we can see together that at least quite a few things are implicated here, which is why it's interesting that the next day, the Sydney Morning Herald goes out with an editor's note. Now, now this is bigger, ostensibly, than the note on top of the Taylor Lorenz article. It's its own article. It's the next day, and it says a note on Rebel Wilson uh, by an individual named Bevan Shields. On Saturday, the Herald published an article about Australian actor Rebel Wilson and her new partner, Ramona Gruma. The article ran online and was a small item on page 36 of Saturday's print edition. So we can read 
right? We, we can do critical analysis here. We know what direction this is going. Very first paragraph of the article, you should know. It was very small. It was on a very late page in the newspaper. What are we even doing here, people? It already has that kind of air of, I guess I have to write this note, but this was not a big deal. The article has promoted some public attention, and I've been reading this feedback closely. In the interests of transparency, I wanted to offer the Herald's view on this issue. Well, thank you for deigning to speak to us on this. Our weekly Private Sydney Celebrity column last week asked Wilson if she wished to comment about her new partner. We would have asked the same questions had Wilson's new partner been a man. To say that the Herald outed Wilson is wrong. So doubling down here, sticking to your guns. Understand that as far as I know, Rebel Wilson had never been seen in the company in this manner of a woman and gets a note from the Sydney Morning Herald that says, hey, get back to us on a very short deadline. Uh, we're, we're publishing this uh, this weekend. I don't know how you want to frame that. That's really up to you. But certainly saying this so defiantly brings some alarm bells in my head, like other mastheads do every day. It's a bit of a pet peeve here. When they refer to themselves as mastheads, it just strikes me as odd. Masthead here, this is the actual name of the outlet. Uh, I guess I like to use outlets here because a masthead is a thing, uh, but they refer to themselves like this. Just a pet peeve. We saw this, I think it was yesterday, talking about the Washington Post and the Tua Culpa, which everyone came into the comments and said, that's what the it is. I don't disagree. I think that is what it refers to. I still think it's very difficult to read, uh, but I will take the comment uh, well advised. They referred to the masthead as doing something. And it's like, well, no, this is designed to really make it a little bit more anonymous, right? It's people all the way down. It's editors, it's journalists, it's associate editors, it's features, department heads, everything that we've talked about in the past. It's people all the way down. Mastheads don't do anything. It's always human action. And when we look at this, it's designed to make you think, well, the Sydney Morning Herald did something. Uh, and we can kind of passive voice this a little bit. We simply ask questions. And as a standard practice, included a deadline for response. Hey, all we did was go out there and ask questions, right? It's not like there's a rule of ethics that talks about being aware of how news gathering will feel to the party in question, right? It's not like there's anything that talks about potential harm or discomfort or acknowledging the fact that news gathering is an uncomfortable kind of concept, right? Pursuit of the news is not a license for arrogance or undue intrusiveness, but we were just asking questions. Uh, this is a person that decided to be an actress and well, that makes it open season. I had made no decision about whether or what to publish, and the Herald's decision about what to do would have been informed by any response Wilson supplied. Hey, you could have gotten mad back at us, and uh, you did give a comment then to a journalistic outlet that can then print that comment and say, you're very, very angry, you're cross at us, but don't worry about that because we are very respectful and ethical people, which is an interesting thing to say in an editor's note, effectively quasi-apologizing for the article that actually did go up. Wilson made the decision to publicly disclose her new partner, who had been a feature of her social media accounts for months. So she made the decision. Our columnist was upset about it. But then, hey, everybody knew about this already. That's a wild bit of rhetorical flourish, right? Hmm. Pick a lane. Private Sydney is a column in which the writer's interaction with his subjects is often part of the story. Saturday's piece followed that theme in giving readers insights into our interaction with Wilson and her PR team. This was not a standard news story. We wish Wilson and Agruma well. So this is interesting. This is the notion that because of your format, because of the way that you choose to make a column out of these interactions, that this doesn't count as a news story which I think we looked at in the code of ethics that we did as not true, right? You don't get an out for ethical considerations of another or what their situation is simply because you otherwise want to frame it as a gossip column and it's just cool kids chatting around the table. That doesn't get you out of what your professional ethical standards would be, which is something that you know because you're now deigning to make an editor's note about it, right? At the point in time where you have to write this, Coming to the end and saying, I shouldn't have to write this, isn't a great argument, isn't a great excuse, which is why this is not the end of our tale. It is, however, the end of our tale uh, in this format, in this particular uh, website. So we have to stop the screen using the magic of background StreamYard technology uh, and share a different one. 
So hang on with me for just a second. And we get to what was the thumbnail image to this article. So after all of this is said, we've looked at some ethics. We looked at the original commentary. They are upset that she went and, what is it, gerumped, gehumped, gazumped, something along those lines. The story right out from under them the next day after. We went June 11th. We went June 12th. This is June 13th. Uh, oh, wait. This is tumbling out of control. We didn't mean for any of this to happen. Apparently, our editor's note with a non-apology didn't assuage the people that are upset about these various things. Oh, no. Who could have guessed this current state of affairs? Well, enter June 13th. I've made mistakes. Or more specifically, I made mistakes over Reverend Wilson, and we'll learn from them. Here's Andrew Hornery coming up. On the weekend, I wrote about the background leading to Rebel Wilson's social media post, we can do this a little bit better, revealing her new relationship with another woman. I have learned some new and difficult lessons from this, and I want to be upfront with you about the things I got wrong. And let me say, uh, first and foremost, I, I'm reading it a little dramatically, but to me, this is the right way to say one of these apologies. The editor's note was the wrong way. That's trying to say, none of this is important. Why am I even here? Why am I doing this? It was a short thing on page 36. Uh, you all are making me because of how you're responding to these things publicly, but whatever. As you get further and further on, this is usually what you see. This is what I had expected from the Washington Post, not quintupling down on what is still an erroneous editor's note, but instead getting to the point where you say, you know what, they actually need legitimate contrition here. And you don't have to believe them because they're obviously being forced to do it, but at least it sounds right. I've learned new and difficult lessons, want to be upfront about the things I got wrong. This is a good start to one of these kinds of articles. I genuinely regret that Rebel has found this hard. These are the kinds of things that are appropriate to comment on, right? To acknowledge that somebody else could have a different perspective from you, even if I'm giving you the full benefit of the doubt, and that as a news gathering body, a journalist, you should be sensitive to that. That is your ethical requirement is to at least consider that. You could consider it and then find it to still be uh, you know, useful and something that should go out into the news, but to actually consider it. And now you have good reflection from this journalist, at least as presented in words on a page. You can evaluate the sincerity yourself that says, I regret, I genuinely regret that Rebel found this hard. That was never my intention, but I see she has handled it all with extraordinary grace. So we're gonna be sincere. I am uh, genuinely regretful. She has done this well. She has done this better than me, honestly. This is the way to write one of these. As a gay man, which we didn't know before, I'm well aware of how deeply discrimination hurts. The last thing I would ever want to do is inflict that pain on someone else. Writing a weekly column about the personal lives of the rich, powerful, and famous comes with its own unique set of challenges. And I don't think that that's wrong. I don't think that that's inaccurate because you're running up against those ethical rules in a very weird way. Because ostensibly, no one actually needs to know who Rebel Wilson's boyfriend is, who Rebel Wilson's girlfriend is, who any of these celebrities are otherwise doing things with if it doesn't impact something important. But the public likes to know these things. It sells newspaper copies. And at some level, it's also kind of uh, useful for these celebrities to get into the media. So there's a kind of parasocial relationship uh, between these various things. So it's a difficult thing to do. I don't deny that. However, when you bring it up in this apology, which is something that you were doing very well with, it starts to sound like you're leaning a little bit on that editor's note about the format is the reason why we can do this, right? That because we've chosen to do a celebrity gossip column, then we get special dispensation. And that's just not the fact. A celebrity romance is a happy story. When I started hearing from friends and associates of Rebel that she was in a new relationship as a gossip columnist, I could see that was potentially a story as her previous boyfriends had been. So after months of posts of the women together on Rebel's Instagram account from Oscar parties to Valentine's Day, and most recently as VIP guests at the Gay and Lesbian World Pride polo match in Florida, I assumed there was a good chance she might be happy to discuss it. Now, this is at least, it's a little bit of excuse making, but it is a reasoned kind of position, right? That this individual could think it's a happy story. Now, by the time he's writing his article, so we have to discount this, he knows it's not, right? He's talking about imperfect worlds while he's angry uh, at her not responding to him and otherwise uh, gazumping, gerumping, whatever it is, his story. Then we get to this point in time where he explains why he thought it might be happy. And it's, it's not inaccurate. I, I can buy this, 
but it also rings a little bit hollow by the time we're looking at the story he actually did write. She had already revealed a month ago that she had been dating and was very happy, but we mishandled steps in our approach. So now we've gotten the genuine regretfulness. We've gotten a sincere sounding apology. We have a little light defensiveness, but something that we can at least allow for because maybe you'd be defensive too. And now we're going to talk about the specifics. I was told by her management to put my questions in an email, which is standard course. Given I have a column every Saturday, I have a deadline, and it is standard procedure to set out the time frame. It is always up to the subject whether or how they want to engage. At 9.27 a.m. last Thursday, so it's early morning Thursday, at least in Australia, good morning, I'm a journalist from the Sydney Morning Herald, and I was hoping I could get a comment from Rebel regarding her new relationship. While I realize Rebel's partner has not been mentioned as of yet, I have several sources who have confirmed their status, and I have enough details to publish. This is probably the sentence where they make a little bit of a mistake. However, in the interests of transparency and fairness, before publishing, I am reaching out to Rebel to see if she will engage in what I believe is a happy and unexpected news story for her, especially given the recent Pride celebrations. My deadline is Friday, 1 p.m. Sydney time, regards Andrew Hornery. So he sends this at 9 a.m. on Thursday and says, honestly, they said two days. Uh, It's about a day. I mean, it's about a day and four hours give or take, that you have to respond to this. And I think anyone can look at this email, especially if they've dealt with journalists and outlets, and think of this as a threat, right? Especially, I have enough details to publish. This is a story. This is going to be a story. I'm going out with it. You have a day to respond to me. Uh, Good luck with that. I think it's happy, but who knows? And that can read as a threat. In fact, I think it probably does read as a threat in this context and with this area of sensitivity. Her response, says this author, would have largely determined what I published. And as my editor noted on Sunday, at that point, no decisions had actually been made by the Herald's editors on whether to publish anything. And yet you told Rebel Wilson that you have enough details to publish, which can be read by any normal person as this is going up. I received no reply, which was entirely Rebel's right, which is a good thing to acknowledge because obviously nobody has any obligation to reply to a journalist. But When you go up with your column, you say you find the lack of response underwhelming because you were otherwise invested in good journalism, which is absolutely ridiculous uh, at the time. In the early hours of Friday morning, Sydney time, Rebel posted on Instagram about finding her Disney princess, Ramona Agruma, which I, along with the rest of the global media, wrote about. So this is Friday morning, about a day later, but before the four hour window where he's going to make a story. My email was never intended to be a threat but to make it clear I was sufficiently confident with my information and to open a conversation. And yet, this is where it should be acknowledged that it can sound like a threat, but it isn't. It is not the Herald's business to out people, and that is not what we set out to do, but I understand why my email has been seen as a threat. So here, a little bit close in time here to where I said you should acknowledge it as a threat. He does, so let's give him credit for that. The framing of it was a mistake. Again, this is the right thing to apologize for. The Herald and I will approach things differently from now on, to make sure we always take into consideration the extra layer of complexities people face when it comes to their sexuality. Celebrities have huge influence in our culture. So here's where we're trying to defend this as public figure stuff. We will still ask questions, sometimes very difficult ones. It would be much worse to write gossip items about the unscripted events in their lives without them having a chance to have their say. But we need to make it clear that a deadline is not an ultimatum. In trying to tell a story within the story, which is what Private Sydney does, the tone of my column on Saturday was also off. I got it wrong. I allowed my disappointment to cast a shadow over the piece. That was not fair, and I apologize. And I think this is probably not good enough, right? You've actually seen the apology. You've seen the description of the sincere regretfulness of this individual with respect to how Rebel Wilson was treated. But to me, that's bad. And uh, unfortunately, the kind of thing that we see from journalistic outlets a lot. But what made it much, much worse was coming out and seeming like you declared ownership of this fact of another person's life and expressing your anger at them going out with it and not giving you the quote unquote scoop. That was where things go wrong. That is maximally unethical rather than kind of a footfall, depending on how you frame these particular situations behind the scenes. And so this is not good enough. I probably would have elevated this because this is why the story exists. This is why there's now three sets of notes on this, why the article gets pulled in its entirety. And it's not because a shadow over the piece was cast on the thing. It's not because that, oh, I guess that was a little more negative than I would have hoped. It's because it speaks directly to the ethical problems that the 
paper has with giving a comment at all. Frankly, if you just read that column as it was originally presented, you would assume that this guy is never going to ask for comment ever again. He's just going to go with things uh, uh, off the hook because he thinks he was burned by having to comply with these ethical standards. And maybe that's not his intent. We can give him the benefit of the doubt. But by the time you get to this point, this is way too light for what that problem actually was. And then as a result, the Herald will take down Saturday's column and replace it with this one. So that's the story, right? That's what happened here. And it wasn't a story I was familiar with. You might be more familiar with it if you're from Brisbane or Melbourne or however else you would like to pronounce uh, your cities. You can try me on any Australian cities. I will probably butcher them to within an inch of their lives, but I will see if they're ever referenced on an episode of Bluey uh, so that I can get a better feel for what that pronunciation might be. But overall, it's a very interesting story because it mirrors some of the things that we've otherwise been talking about in this space, right? It mirrors the concepts of the Washington Post and Taylor Lorenz uh, and everything else that we have talked about and whether or not these journalistic outlets can be trusted to tell the truth. When you've got somebody going out there uh, into the world and saying effectively, we don't like that we had to give notice. We feel like we were taking advantage of uh, because we gave this notice. It doesn't make you, you know, fill with hope that everything is going to go right here, right? Wilson opted to gazump our story. After she sued for defamation, her choice to ignore our discreet, genuine, and honest queries was, in our view, underwhelming. Really? Okay. Well, at least as of yesterday, it would seem that this columnist uh, has been talked to behind the scenes, genuinely regrets the whole situation, etc. But... I don't know whether or not that's accurate. I don't know whether we should have to believe that. I think it was well it was well written. We'll see how that journalist and that outlet proceeds on these kinds of stories. But I still think it's important because when we look at these kinds of things, it's going to govern how we think about every other journalist and how they treat comments, how they treat requests for comment, how they treat what it is that they're actually writing about, whether they resent the ethical bounds that are designed to make things more accurate and more useful to the public. And so that's why I wanted to raise it today. I thought it was really, really interesting. Uh, we're going to talk through some super chats. I see a big one has been given. So thank you for the support. We'll talk about that uh, in just a second. Otherwise, uh, that's the only article I have prepared today. We're going to hang out a little bit more. Maybe we'll just do hour long episodes uh, as we have some of these stories, uh, if that makes sense. Or maybe I'll prepare two articles uh, on other episode days. Before we get into those super chats, I do want to mention again, I said this yesterday, uh, but right now we're trying out a schedule that will do headlines, hangouts on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, and then also on Thursdays and Fridays. So uh, in terms of shorthand, Wednesdays off, uh, essentially. And we're going to try that out. That would be four days a week, but with that break day in the middle of the week that I think could work pretty well. Uh, so there won't be a Hangouts and Headlines tomorrow, he says, unless something big breaks. Uh, but uh, I do think that that's a schedule that I can keep up with. But we're going to check that out probably for a couple of weeks. So with that said, we're going to pop into Super Chats. Uh, we're going to hang out a little bit more. Leave a super chat if you want. Leave a normal chat if I see it or if Mrs. Hoaglaw sees it. I will try to talk about those as well. And we'll just uh, we'll just hang out about this because I think I think that was an interesting story and I'm glad we talked about it. I wrestled the bear once. Thank you for the super chat. Says, with every word you say, I watch me wither away. But like a fool, I stay. And now I don't recognize me. I let you clip my wings and bury me in your shame. I can't walk away because it just hurts the same. Thank you. Steep. I suspect that's a song of some kind, but I apologize for not recognizing it. Mandy Stevens, you get the Australian pronunciation of Melbourne right. Hello from small country town, Benalla, in Australia. That's all I got. <laughs> Annette, Annette Matz, what you should know is that the Sydney Morning Herald is a Fairfax publication and is politically opposed to New Corp, the Murdoch publications. So being a bit more to the left, means that it's more sensitive to minority issues because that's their readership. And it should be. Sensitivity is important for whatever your subject is going to be. But thank you for the context, because obviously I can't look in to every outlet's political leanings on these various things. And I did know that the Murdoch companies had a strong force in Australia, which we saw in the Depp v. Heard trial, certainly. Uh, so I appreciate that. It's not something that I can otherwise cover. So anyone that ever wants to give me context, on the outlets that I otherwise talk about uh, is always, always very, very valuable. Thank you so much for the super chat. I wrestled the bear once. I'm sorry, my dude. I never meant to hurt you or say the mean, hurtful things I said. I'm so sensitive. And if I'm hurt, it's usually at times 100 
the times anyone else has been hurt. Please accept this as my formal apology, friend. Thank you, I wrestled the bear once. I appreciate that. Britt Cormier, I am not a fan of the total retraction, especially if it has been up for longer than a few days. Other pieces could have been written that referenced the original article. Once removed, we will never be able to fact check the child pieces. Yeah, and thank you very much for the very generous super chat, Brett. I tend to agree. I tend to agree that it is better for us to be able to see the mistakes and to understand that you can link out to an apology and you can read the apology for kind of a full understanding of the situation as you look through things, but that it's important to know what you're apologizing for, right? We don't actually get the specifics that I was able to find in that Twitter thread from the apology. If we didn't have the reference to the column directly, we wouldn't actually know about uh, the language usage and what is worthy of apology there, which is that kind of upsetness that you were scooped by the subject matter of your article. That's the way journalism works. That's the understood risk of it going and asking for comment. You see this all the time, especially in politics, but it doesn't make it less required that you go and ask a subject that you're going to cast in a potentially negative light for that comment. So I tend to agree. I tend to agree, but I also am, am glad that at least some step was taken uh, to try to mitigate the damage that they felt that that column had caused. So I understand how they arrive at the other answer. And I'm not sure that one is philosophically better than the other, although I would go in your direction, Britt. Zach Frisch, so they had no idea. They just cold call celebs asking if anything's new. Lol, 10 out of 10 journalism. No, in fact, it's clear that they were following the Instagram posts uh, on this. And one of the excuses their editor makes is, is effectively, well, everyone knew this already, which is ridiculous or else you wouldn't be so angry about the quote unquote scoop, right? Andrew Nichols, uh, try Seduna is how an American would say that. So I suspect that's wrong. What would I do to really change this up? k I'm going to go with k -Dunna. How close am I, Australians? Huh? Anything? No? It's not Seduna or k -Dunna. Do I have a right pronunciation on this? All right, we'll come back to it. <laughs> Aaron Flemons, wearing my Reasonable Minds Can Differ shirt while joining this morning. Thanks for my new morning routine, Hub. Well, thank you for getting a shirt. Love reasonable minds can differ type stuff. Thank you so much for the support, both in shirt wearing uh, and in super chat form. Really appreciate it. Uh, oh, I'm getting laughed at for Seduna, so I guess it's pronounced differently. We, we, we had such a good streak going just by clipping the end of the borns uh, and the bins. Uh, Nita, as a lesbian, it terrifies me that I could be outed without my permission. The world is a scary place and people aren't always nice. Of course, makes total sense. And journalists need to be cautious and careful about these things. They know this. Like, they know that behind the scenes. The happy uh, incident kind of stuff rings entirely false. Uh, because that email 100% sounds like a threat. You have a day. I have all I need. Okay. All right. All right, boss. Uh, absolutely 100% sounds like a threat. Thomas Hogue. Hey, Dad. The constant machinations of the apologies is why I prefer just taking the story down with a sincere apology. Something I wish the Post had done. Well, see, we have the other side of the coin here, right? We have Britt saying the takedown shouldn't happen. We have my dad, Thomas Hogue, saying it should happen. And I think I think I side with Britt on this one, Dad, because I do think that it is useful to be able to figure out what happened. And I think not everybody is going to do what we just did here, although we will have this in the video archive. Check it out on Just the Headlines whenever that gets done. Uh, but... Uh, other people won't know what they're apologizing for. And in the framing that we saw, even in the apology column, they don't actually go far enough to actually talk about what they did that was so problematic to me. They cast a shadow on the column from their negativity. Isn't quite the same as, she stole our story. Uh, and I think that's important to actually have your feet continue to be held to the fire there. I would agree with you, I think, more if there was a defamatory type statement. Right. If we look at the Amber Heard op ed and you have a jury finding, if there is something that is shown through process or otherwise to be false and that shouldn't be out there just projected into the world because people aren't necessarily going to follow the apology link. At that point in time, I think the weight kind of goes in the other direction. But for this, this article, which is basically just the Sydney Morning Herald columnist showing his whole butt to the public. I think that should stay up so that people understand that was what was done. That was happened. That that was part of your history. Here's the apology. I regret my errors, but you need to know what those errors were. So I side with Britt on this one, dad, but I appreciate the super chat. Thank you so much. And good morning to you. And I think we saw a couple more super chats come in really 
uh, towards the end here. Oh, just, just one more. Just one more. Having fun. Here's David. So the rule is, if it contains actual defamation, all of the Washington Post, keep it up. If it makes the outlet look bad, pull it down. Got it. Thumbs up emoji. One could read the situation that way. Yes. This column doesn't say wrong things. It makes the Sydney Morning Herald look bad. It gets pulled down, replaced with an apology that does look better. It is more well-considered. It is more well-written. It mitigates what the problem was in the original column. It's a little bit of PR for the newspaper. The Washington Post says, you know what? This whole trial is pretty popular and it's getting some clicks. What if we just put a billboard up at the top that says, we know this is false, uh, but we enjoy your clicks. So please on clicking through. Uh, yeah, I think that you could absolutely read the situation that way. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. Uh, it's uh, it's funny, right? It's, it's one of those situations where uh, I want to give the benefit of the doubt. That's the kind of guy I am, but I really don't blame anybody for, for saying those kinds of things. Jay Jones, I graduated with a journalism degree in 2013 and very quickly left the entire field. This type of behavior is prominent and I felt like I was being asked to sell my soul. I love watching your analysis here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I have no doubt that there can be pressures put on journalists by the outlet or by their competition or otherwise. I, that's why there's an ethical code of conduct is because that's in the understanding that there will be pressure and there will be desires or potential benefits from going outside these rules that could otherwise harm people. Uh, and so that's why professional ethics are important. That's why they're important in the practice of law. That's why they're important in the practice of journalism and other professions as well. Uh, I have no doubt, however, that as the potential journalistic outlets have expanded and spread out, that there are portions of that field uh, that are a little fast and loose with ethics rules. I will tell you, that's not a slight on journalism. There are, there are lawyers that are fast and loose with ethics rules. I don't like to hang out with them, uh, but there are definitely lawyers that do those kinds of things as well. So I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that you got that degree and like immediately left the field. Uh, but thank you so much for the kind words and for the super chat support. Britt Cormier, the difference between the Amber Heard op-ed and this, we have the entire op-ed in the court transcripts now, so it's public. They can take that article down now at any time, and we still have it on the record. That's fair. There are ways to know about that op-ed. Washington Post wants its clicks. I don't really think that the note saves them that says a jury found it to be defamatory, but here you go. Uh, but I also don't think that it's highly likely uh, that Johnny Depp or anyone else on his team wants to pursue a lot more legal action on this. Uh, so at the end of the day, I suspect they're making both a legal and real politic kind of decision to keep those clicks and to keep that up uh, because they don't think it will burn them. Will it? Well, we don't know that. I wrestled the bear once. Thank you so much for the super chat. I'm sorry once again. So sorry, my dude. I got so mad at this mod upside down that kept muting me for no reason. I can't feel sorry for him, but I feel sorry for lashing out at you. Sorry, dude. I really didn't take anything that you said as lashing out, but I have to admit, I didn't fully understand it. Uh, so I, I thank you for the super chat support. Uh, we do have uh, mods that otherwise uh, uh, try to keep things away from ad hominem attacks and on a reasonable minds can differ uh, approach. So if that was happening to you here, I'm very sorry for that, but we definitely try to keep the conversations going in a reasonable way. Thank you so much for the support. Uh, what else do we have here? Guys are all getting in all these super chats. I thought we were going to be done. El Bon, in my opinion, leave it up. Put retracted at the beginning of the title, preceding the article with an explanation and apology, and maybe a big header graphic saying, oops. I do like it. You could have an ethical rule standard of conduct. It's like some big kind of stamp where that everybody knows when you see the picture of the pineapple that something really bad happened here. Uh, and then you could put that up so that everybody could know uh, it's the scarlet pineapple that you screwed up on some kind of journalistic basis. I, I do like the kind of, tell the world, Sydney Morning Herald, tell the world. Rick Cormier, last thing this morning, I love the way we edit the US Constitution. We line out what we have revoked, but we keep it in so we can still read the words so we always know what was said. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on which way you're reading it. We do have red line versions that you can look at. Uh, you could also see those with the Code of Federal Regulations. I mean, I don't recommend it. It's some 800,000 pages or whatever. Uh, but you can also see those reference points. You also get fun footnotes in that document that are like, well, Congress referenced this, but that is a regulation of sock uh, elasticity requirements. And this is a fire bill. So we think they got the reference wrong. It's probably this. And you get those kinds of fun footnotes in those as well. But definitely, it is worthwhile to know what came before so that you could reflect on what is happening 
now. Thank you so much, Britt. I really appreciate all the support this morning. Um, Miles Heffernan, thank you so much for the support. So you know, the Sydney Morning Herald has released a third apology and clarification. They absolutely shook Rebel down, and the whole newsroom is super angry. By the way, love this channel. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if we can find that on the fly. There's a third apology? Man, we might we might have the unexpected extension of this episode if I can find that. Let's see here. Um, my links are turned off, so you can't link it directly to me. Let's see if we can find that on the fly. I appreciate it. Let's see. We got the BBC News saying they offer apology but deny doing anything to out the actress. We read that one. All I have is the one day ago stuff as of right now. Oh, no, no, hang on. Oh, Bevan Shields is back. All right, Encore, I think. Miles Heffernan, thank you for the support. I think we are going to have an Encore here. Oh, this is exciting. Thomas Hogue, really good discussion, everyone. I accept your amendment to my comment. Should say, if defamatory, well done. Well, thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. Uh, I, and I appreciate the support, of course. Uh, I guess let's uh, let's do this again here. This has never happened before. This is a uh, this is an exciting time here in uh, virtual legality. Let's make that a little bigger. Sorry, you're getting to see a little bit of the sausage here. I didn't have this ready. June fourteenth. 2022, 427 p.m. That time hasn't happened yet, Australia. Wow. Time travel. Um, note to subscribers, what we got wrong with the Rebel Wilson story. Now you get to see me look at one of these live without ever having read it before. So let's do it together. Given the attention on the Herald over the past few days, I wanted to get in touch directly with, your, with our subscribers and, and with us here in the internet. Don't tell them we don't subscribe to the Sydney Morning Herald. As you may know, the Herald... Private Sydney gossip columnist Andrew Hornery and I have been strongly criticized over the weekend about our coverage of actor Rebel Wilson and her new partner, Ramona Agruba. And I think I contributed to that strong criticism just now. I have always tried to be upfront and transparent with you as subscribers. So here's the background of what happened and an apology for getting it wrong. I have offered the same information to staff at the Herald and it's only right that you hear it too. Now, the super chat we got on this did suggest that the newsroom was upset about it, and I can't really blame them. So here we're having what appears to be, at least as offered at the top of this article, another repetition of what was described in the email and the process. So we'll have to see if new information is actually put forth here. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels. Andrew, who has been writing for more than three decades, so here's an appeal to authority. He's done this a lot. Approached me last week to say he had been told Wilson was in a new relationship with the Gruma and that he wanted to approach her for comment. A celebrity romance is a regular staple of gossip columns. Sure, I agreed that approaching her for comment was an appropriate thing to do, given a Gruma had featured prominently with Wilson on Instagram, and given that Wilson had recently revealed she was in a new relationship and happy. So the reason we asked for comment was not negative light, but because she was featured prominently on Instagram and had revealed she was in a new relationship. That's not a reason to ask for comment. That's a reason to believe that this is accurate. That's data that goes in, in front of, hey, we think this is a legitimate story. So this is an interesting argument here. Maybe I'm just missing it and can get clarity from the chat or something. Uh, but looking at this, this doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Comment is appropriate, I guess, being the concept that we're going to write this story because we have this extra data. Um, so maybe that's why comment is appropriate. I'm anticipating writing the story. At that point, if that's in fact how you're supposed to read that paragraph, the original note from this guy that says, I hadn't even decided whether we would write the story or not uh, until we, we got the comment is a little bit disingenuous because if the reason why you're asking for comment is we've got enough already, which is certainly what the journalist suggested and now the editor is suggesting again, uh-oh, I've got a few yellow flags going up. I had made no decision to publish anything and expected to make a call on Friday about what to do next based on whether Andrew heard from Wilson. Okay, backing down from that, as we heard before, I want to be really clear about an important point. If she had not responded, I would not have published. Now that isn't out there, and this is a very useful stance to take in the aftermath of the event, 
I have to say the gif, I don't believe you, seems appropriate right here. And I don't know whether people are believing him in Sydney or elsewise in Australia, uh, but he didn't commit to this on the 12th. The, the note that he puts forth on the 12th says, I hadn't decided, but he doesn't say this sentence. This is a change in stance. Now you could offer, well, he just didn't say it. He omitted to say it on the 12th. But if it's true, it's an important part of his story. He is essentially solidifying his position by saying, I wouldn't have published. That isn't known before this. And now as we get to the 14th, this is day four of a crisis situation for the trust in your publication. Uh, you've now gone and made something that is a very useful statement for you to make in a fashion that would have been useful in the immediate aftermath of the situation. So I've got a lot of discounting to do on this. But I, I see the X's. Is that press X to doubt? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I am acutely aware of the dark stain on the Herald's history. I am not. Via the publication of the names, addresses, and occupations of dozens of people who marched in the 1978 gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. Oh, wow. In 2016, our editor-in-chief at the time, Darren Goodsir, apologized for that wrong. Well, it's only a few years ago. Hmm. In the end, we didn't publish a story revealing Wilson's new relationship because she made the announcement on Instagram. Uh, yes, you, you didn't publish it because you gave her a deadline that was after when she announced it herself. However, mistakes were made in our approach to Wilson, and I apologize for them. As Andrew explained yesterday, the inclusion of a two-day deadline was an error. It was, it was one day in a few hours as it appeared to be an ultimatum or attempt to pressure Wilson to make an announcement herself or through the Herald. This is a good acknowledgement. I actually think this is better than what Andrew said. I, I see how it could have been a threat. It 100% looks like a threat. Uh, and so acknowledging it here is a little bit stronger. Another error was a piece Andrew wrote for Saturday's paper, an online edition, in which he expressed annoyance that Wilson had decided to make the announcement herself on Instagram. Andrew acknowledges the tone of Saturday's piece was not appropriate, and I asked for it to be removed from online. I appreciate Andrew being upfront about this. It's day three of the crisis when he says this. The Saturday piece should not have been published, and that is ultimately on me as an editor. Indeed, it is. So when we talk about your judgment in editing, and you say, well, I wouldn't have put it up. If you put up that Saturday post with that garbage, I don't have faith in you. Again, X to doubt. For that, I apologize to Wilson and anyone offended by it. Okay. On Sunday... I wrote a small note defending our approach to Wilson, confirming that we had made no decision to publish anything and explaining that the private Sydney column is often about Andrew's interactions with his subjects. People make mistakes, and my intention with this Sunday note was to provide clarity about exactly what happened and why Andrew approached Wilson. As editor, I was conscious of supporting staff, but I should have also acknowledged our mistakes, which is what I'm doing today. The Herald is an inclusive masthead and an ally of LGBTIQ plus readers and Australians. It's one of the many reasons I'm proud to work here. This episode was far from ideal, understatement. And while there was no malice involved, I recognize our mistakes and apologize for them. We value the support and feedback of our subscribers and readers and have learned from this. I've never said learnt so many times. It's always learned uh, to me. Well, okay. You can decide for yourself how much you want to uh, doubt that particular statement, the sincerity with which it was given or otherwise. I don't have much belief in this at all. Actually, the sincerity of Andrew's statement, the journalist's statement, both when he originally puts up the column where he's clearly pissed, and I find that pretty disgusting in context, but he's clearly upset. That's sincere. His apology also seems sincere. This gentleman does not seem sincere. And again, that's vibes, right? That's reading between the lines. That's editorialization from me. But as presented with what we know, the language that is used and how beneficial it is in this context on the 14th, I don't believe basically any of the framework that this gentleman actually has to say. He feels like he's being forced, maybe by his newsroom or otherwise. And that's very different from the journalist who I actually give more credit to, even though he's the one that put up that article that I find so problematic. So thank you very much for telling me about the third apology. I really didn't expect that one. We wouldn't have covered it at all. And thank you. I just really, really appreciate it. You made this episode better. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think we're basically at the end of all this, but I really am curious as to whether or not you guys find that specific editor's note uh, to be uh, doubtful or to be worthy of uh, consideration, veracity. Uh, and so I think it's uh, I think it's an interesting piece of the pie here. We do have a lot of these. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with this, this is really for my dad. 
was a meme, press X to doubt. Uh, and so when you see these kinds of things, this is expressing doubt uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the veracity of the statements that we are otherwise reading. And then you occasionally get something like this. Wow. And I tend to agree with that as we read it as well. The apology makes it okay? No, I don't think they're actually claiming that the apology makes it okay. I, and I think they need to apologize, but there's just a lack of sincerity. It's a performative apology in a way that I actually really didn't see very much uh, with the journalist's apology itself. So I think they actually took a step back. I think they should have stopped. Sometimes you got to stop while you're ahead. And I think with the Andrew apology, things were going better. Uh, and I think this guy, whoever he is, is clearly facing pressure from someone. Giggle in SC, I came for the hangout, hoagie for life. We do a lot of hanging out here. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, this latest revision seems to have covered all their bases, hasn't it? What more could you want? Sincerity. Oh yeah, no, as a functional mechanical thing, that's what they're doing with this, with the editor's note. I actually think they took a step back though. I think the journalist had it right. Um, I think the 12th note was bad, but the 13th kind of fixes that wrong. And now the 14th goes back to, oh, you're a cold calculating editor who is saying what he thinks he needs to say uh, and doesn't have the same level uh, of sincerity that we saw in the other context. In my opinion, you can differ. Reasonable minds can differ on this. And I'm happy to hear uh, those differences. But I found that one to be wanting. Uh, Yvonne Drought, he gives arguments against an attempt of outing, not about letting the Saturday piece going out. He says he is sorry, but did he even read slash edit the piece before being published? I don't know, right? He says, oh, it was my mistake. But did you actually read that? Did you actually look at that when they're complaining about her giving her own story and you're discussed with her not commenting? Did you read it? Because that's where this comes from. And honestly, and, and this might just be my personal tilt, I am more empathetic to the journalist that's just feeling grumpy because that all happened and he had a good story and she got out in front of it than the editor who is supposed to be the passive journalistic resource that says, what, what, what is this, my man? Why, why is this in the column? Fix that up. Uh, and he doesn't. So he either didn't do his job or he agreed with the premise and now they are flailing. Uh, and that really, I think, came to the fore in today's note. Miles Heffernan. So the Australian newspaper found the journalist is full of it as his Insta post called us running with pitchforks. See Miles Chef on Twitter. My God, man, you're just giving all the content here uh, and, and you're doing super chats to do it. I really appreciate it. Um, I did see that. So I didn't include that. There are comments uh, from the journalists, especially in the moment, talking about the Pitchfork Brigade, right? Doing at least a bit of a version of the Taylor Lorenz, they're all out to get me. Uh, and he's definitely responsible for what he wrote. That was definitely disgusting. Uh, and I will check out on that Twitter uh, after this episode. But I think it is important um, to note that these people are human beings. They do make mistakes. I don't love it when they start to say, hey, everybody else is responsible but me. But I also understand it much more than I understand the editor going out with what he went out with. Um, so thank you so much, Miles Heffernan. It's amazing stuff uh, to bring to my attention and to get into this video. Uh, I am so, so thankful for that. Uh, Raber Umfenor, these outlets, explodey head emoji, explodey head emoji, explodey head emoji. It's like a treehouse. Mine is the fun. I like that. It's a good metaphor. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and then we're just going to close off here with a couple more chats. Uh, CG, thanks for the great show. Thank you for the support, CG. I really appreciate it. Uh, Moody Goy, hey, Rick, would you consider doing an illustration of the feasibility of suing Sony for false advertising in the Morbius trailer? I have neither seen Morbius nor heard anyone complaining about false advertising, but I like the concept. So I will look into it. Uh, that could be fun. I will tell you, spoiler alert, very difficult to sue for false advertising on a movie trailer, uh, but I will look at it. I will absolutely look at it. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yes. Like everyone. Yes, please do like and subscribe if you like this content. That tells YouTube that we're here having these conversations. We've got 1,600 people here early in the morning uh, in the Eastern Time Zone in the United States. Very much appreciate it from everybody. Uh, and I think that's going to do it for today's episode. So a wild little story. Uh, I would like to cover these kinds of things. I'd also like to cover uh, things that show good argumentation, that really establish evidence, cover things from both sides, things like that Natalie Schur article that we looked at during the trial and others. They are out there. Again, folks, I can't get everywhere. I can't see every headline. I do want to branch out and talk about more stuff. If you see something that looks cool, DM me. I can't promise a response or more than a thumbs up, depending on what I'm doing that day, but I see them all. 
and they are making it into these videos. So if you are interested in me covering anything that you think is interesting, uh, you know, leave me a note, send me the headline. All of that is really, really helpful to making sure that this kind of thing is as useful and as fun as it can be. And thank you so much to Miles for bringing to our attention an article I didn't see before this video and making it an even better stream. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Tomorrow we're off. We're taking Wednesdays off right now. We'll see if that schedule holds. Might re-examine it next week, but tomorrow we're off. Thank you so much, and I will see you on Thursday's episode of Hangouts, probably with a virtual legality prime in the interim if you're interested in that. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great one.